this set up here. All right, guys, this is uh, Pastor Greg here with the God Standard, and we're at Releasing the Power of God Part 5. This is going to be the last uh, in, in our series, but uh, like I was saying before we went live, Evelyn fell off here, she comes back in. Before we went live, you know, this is something that needs to be a part of church culture. And, and I've had several conversations in the last week, you know, when people were saying, hey, I'm, I'm looking for a ministry and, you know, and, and obviously I'm going to direct somebody towards a spirit filled ministry. Um, one of the questions I always ask is, does the congregation pray for the sick? Not just in a, in a uh, Sunday night service, do they pray for the sick in a, a regular service? And the reason I bring that up is, is because a while ago, you know, I, I felt the Lord show me in Romans 15, verse 18 and 19. It talked about, you know, Paul was talking about the working of signs, wonders, and workings of miracles. And he said, I have fully proclaimed the gospel. And everything God does is in word and deed. So I don't believe that you could take the word of God and separate it from the activities of God. And if you do, it's dead, right? Because there's no growth in it. So it's just something that I always ask. You know, is it something where, you know, they're in a place as a congregation, dependent on the power of God to bring change in the lives of people? And if not, and it's just a sermon, but there's no demonstration, you know, I tell people, listen, I would actually pray about that. And, and I think all churches are good. Anytime the word of God is being preached, it's good. But eventually it has to lead you to an encounter with God. Well, well, why is that? Well, the average Christian makes it in church about two years. I don't know if you guys know that. And well, why is it only two years? Because for a lot of people, it can be just a discipline, right? It's the discipline of going to church. But eventually, if you don't have an experience with God, an actual God encounter in your life, it's very hard to deal with the storms of life, not knowing whether or not this is real or not, right? Because everybody has a perspective of, of what we call reality. And reality is the world as it actually exists. You know, and, and I don't have it in my notes, but, you know, in John 8, 32, um, I'm going to talk about this tomorrow where it says you're going to know the truth and the truth will make you free, right? In the two words, if you're ever going to study it out, look at the word know and look at the word truth. You know, knowing is a perception, a perception of what? Your reality. What's your reality based on? It's based on your experience, right? It's based on your experience. So your experience is kind of kind of set the limitations of what you feel you can do and what you feel God is going to do, right? And so it's all based on our experience. Well, in order to know anything, you'll see in your concordance, the first word that comes up is discernment. So I have to discern the ultimate reality of God, which is his world. And I was talking, and I'm, I'm going way off notes, but I'm going to just kind of be led here. But I was talking to uh, Jenny, I think it was yesterday. And, you know, we we're talking about ties, we we're talking about certain things. And I said, you know, when God says he's going to open up the floodgates of heaven or he's going to open up the windows of heaven, we have to know that there's three different heavens. There's a first heaven, which is the realm in which you live in. And it's a realm that you see. There's a second heaven. I talked about this last week in the offering. There's a second heaven, which is the realm of angels and demons. Right. And it's the realm of the unseen. But then there is a third heaven. The third heaven is where. The, the throne of God has been already established. It's a domain that's been established, right? Um, you know, in, in I think it's Proverbs uh, 3 and 19, it says that, that, um, that God had laid the foundations of the earth, but he has established heaven, right? So if something's been established, then it can't be challenged. And, and where are you going with all this? Well, in an open heaven, type situation. And when God gives us access to an open heaven, that means it's where his kingdom rules and reigns and is established. And he's giving us access to that. Well, can, can the devil go and bring sickness and disease in the third heaven? Absolutely not. So when we're saying your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're not talking about the first heaven. We're not talking about the second heaven. We're talking about a third heaven that the enemy cannot mess with because it's divine and it's perfect, you know, in, in, in having that, you know, come into your life. So God wants to give us access to that realm. And when we can experience that realm, we can know true peace, right? We can know what breakthrough feels like. And we can know when we start having these experiences with God 
then we know what his reality uh, uh, looks like. We know what it sounds like, and we know what it feels like because we've experienced it, right? And, but it says, we'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. So you're going to be able to perceive truth, which requires discernment, and his truth is his reality. It's his kingdom. So it all is grounded in an experience. And why am I talking about testimonies? And I keep hammering this thing, because even if you can't see, even if you can't hear, because everybody has a different experience, well, guess what? You're still going to be able to, to remember what God has done. Why? Because you have the word of God. And it says the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. So if the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy, and God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Jesus same yesterday, today, and forever, it says that God will revisit you in a place of testimony. That's what it literally means. It means to do again. Look it up in the Hebrew. UW do, UWD, UD. It means God will revisit the testimony. So this teaching is to get people not just hearing someone preach, but knowing what's available so people can get their breakthrough. That's why when we see when we see breakthrough in the church, right? You know, and I, I talked about a couple of weeks ago. So tomorrow, I, I guarantee you're going to see healings, miracles, and, and you're going to see deliverance take place. You are going to see it, right? And what's going to happen? It's going to shift people's, it's going to create an experience, which is going to shift what people know about God, right? You'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. It will shift your perspective about God. Here's the only problem, you know, when the Holy Spirit starts moving. When the Holy Spirit starts moving, you know, people will look at what I believe is, is presence and, and, you know, the presence of God coming. And the, the downside of that is they'll judge presence of God based on experience, right? So they'll say, well, in worship, it's okay to cry. Okay. Well, they'll say uh, they're opening up the altars. I don't know if I believe in this healing. This kind of violates my list. Oh, that person's up there shaking. I don't know if I believe in that because that kind of violates my list. You know, and, and I have a lot of people who like, hey, Pastor Greg, what's up with this whole falling down thing? And I tell them the reason that you're asking me about that is because you've never been up to the altar. You've never had an experience with God in that capacity. So what do I do? I invite them up for prayer. Is it about falling down? Absolutely not. But here's what I know. I let God in his presence, his Holy Spirit, do what he wants to do up at the altar. If somebody gets delivered and they're bam, they go out, then they go out, you know, is it my goal for people just to get slain in the spirit and go down? No, my goal is to preach the word of God. It's to make the declaration of the word of God. And it's, and it's the Holy Spirit's job to perform the very word that's being spoken, Mark 16 and 20. So what am I getting at? I don't, you know, uh, judge manifestations. I judge presence, right? I judge presence. Now, my job and our job as a congregation is to perceive presence. Now, whatever God decides to do in that presence, we have to take whatever list we have and whatever expectation we have, and we have to throw it away. God's not a manageable deity, and he's often going to color outside the lines of your experience in order to expand it. I'm going to talk about it in, in the book of Mark because the disciples put limitations on Jesus, right? And Jesus had unlimited access to the kingdom, right? So we started this in review Talking about access, we started talking about inheritance, you know, uh, uh, five weeks ago, you know, I brought up the scripture in Isaiah 54 and 17, it says that your protection is your inheritance, right, and your vindication belongs to him, so I brought up the word inheritance because that's what God brought to me, even though the fast is over, God is going to build upon that word this year, you know, we talked about 2022 being a year of, you uh, you know, uh, of, of disorder and chaos for most people. But it's also talking about an open heaven for you. And what is that? That is your inheritance. Open heaven is what God has for you in his realm. And his realm is the third heaven. And his third heaven is a perfect, it's the ultimate reality, right? You know the truth and the truth will make you free. So the truth is based on an ultimate reality that you have access to, and there's an invitation. So when the presence of God falls 
and we understand that this is God, right? Then we don't judge what God is doing. Allow the Holy Spirit, especially up at the altar, allow him to do what he wants to do. I don't have to force anything. My job, again, is to make the declaration. It's the Holy Spirit's job to get him free. However he wants to get him free, that's up to him. But I'm not going to try and exaggerate some type of move of God and, you know, and, and, and force something that's not there, right? It's allowing the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do. But this teaching is about connecting to the reality of the kingdom and being able to get kingdom in your life. And we do it through an inheritance. Well, what's an inheritance? An inheritance is the freely received, which you did not labor for. Understand somebody paid the price, right? For you to receive something for free. But make no mistake about it. If I take this inheritance and if we go to Trinity Life Center and we are, are, are involved in the presence of God and the things of God are happening, and if we never talk about it to people and we never talk about it with our children, then we're doing a disservice to them. Why? Because that's what the generation of Joshua did. The generation of Joshua actually went into the promised land. They experienced the miracles in the wilderness. They experienced the miracles in the promised land. But what didn't they do? They did not pass on the testimony. So we see the generations after Joshua, uh, the children of Ephraim, it said that in Psalm 78, it says that they were equipped for the battle, but they turned, they were turned back in the time of war. Why? It says because they forgot the testimony. They forgot what's available to them because it was never communicated to them by the generation of Joshua. They did not communicate it. That's why when I go to school in the morning, you know, um, a lot of the ministries I follow are, are from Africa. You know, TB Joshua, Alf Lukau, uh, Bishop Oyedipo, um, because they have a miracle mindset. And I like to stay connected to that. But what's one of the things I do? I show I show these videos to my kids. You know, I know I, I sent I sent a... Uh, I sent a video to pastor this week and uh, he goes, man, you messed me up. And I said, how did I mess you up? He goes, that video you sent out, he goes, that one messed me up. I think he said he got somebody healed of a headache or something like that. And he goes, he goes, you know, I felt in my faith, I felt pretty accomplished. And I said, cool. He goes, and then you send me a video of pastor Alf Lukau raising a man from the dead. He goes, and that just messed me up. And, and <laughs> I explained to him, when we're talking about miracles and things like that, you know, a lot of times God will color outside the lines because you think that the realm that God wants to use you in is going to be progressive. You think, well, we're going to start with a headache and then we're going to start with, you know, uh, uh, psoriasis and then we're going to keep going on. Well, what if the first person you pray for is somebody that, you know, they're dying, they have terminal cancer and God immediately just raises them up. What's that going to do in your life? It's going to have you pursue that level that you once walked at, right? And that's what God did, I know, in my life, is very young in the Lord, a paralyzed man was raised out of bed. And I asked God, I said, where's the progression in that? He goes, oh, I was just showing you at the level that you're going to walk at. He goes, that's your norm. He goes, I was just crediting that to you. He goes, now it's your job to pursue me to get back to that level, which, which God says, I consider that normal for you. So whatever list you have, you got to get rid of it and you got to say, hey, your job is to get into presence and to recognize presence. Right. And that's why I've been bringing up uh, Revelation 19 and 10, because it's saying, listen, even if you don't have this prophetic anointing flowing in your life at the level you want. Now, remember, John 10, 27 says my sheep know my voice. But even if it's not flowing at the level, you can borrow other people's testimonies because it's the activity of God that flowed through somebody else's life. And when we talk about Revelation 19 and 10, it says, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. The testimony is what God said and did. Remember, word and deed. And the person that experienced it is the witness of it, right? A witness is a person that experienced what Jesus said and did, right? And that's why that's so powerful in the, in the, in the power of a witness is, is phenomenal because the same anointing that they were involved in says through that scripture that you could call upon that miracle and that breakthrough and that same anointing that that witness experience will now come upon your life and God is giving you unlimited access to the prophetic voice of God in your life. And what is the prophetic voice? The prophetic voice will change a current situation and it will allow you to foretell and foresee the future that God has for you, right? 
And that's why that's powerful. This is kind of review. Psalm 119 and 111 says, your testimonies are my inheritance forever. They're the joy of my heart. Well, I was talking about that generation of Joshua. We as parents have to do our job. You know, I've, I've dealt in the last week, I've dealt with a couple of children. And Pastor Greg, how do you fix our children? I said, I don't. I got to fix the parent first. Well, 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 what do you mean by that? Because if I get your kids free, then that standard of freedom that they're now carrying, you as a parent are going to violate it if you haven't been free. You will not be able to enforce it in the lives of your children. So what does that mean? It means I got to get you free first as a parent. And technically, I should allow you to walk in that freedom for about six months before I even deal with your kids. Well, what are you talking about? Well, sickness is one thing, but deliverance is another. You know, if it's a deliverance issue, I got to see that the parent can walk this thing out for at least six months. Otherwise, I'm going to mess up that family. So what am I going to first do? Get in church. Okay, they're there. Been there a couple of weeks. Start reading some of these books. Start getting involved in some of these classes. Start changing your culture. Start having some experiences with God. So, oh, yeah. So uh, I'll get you the notes right here. Everyone in the meeting. Sorry about that. So we got to have we got to start having these experiences and not just having the experiences. We have to invite our children in. That's why my children were the first ones to see Amen. on the way to school. I'm like, hey, check this out. You know, uh, uh, this man of God is, is raising someone from the dead. You know, and, and I look at people and I look at their responses and I came to, I think I came to Wednesday night service and I showed it to Mitch and I showed it to Jeremiah and, and that kind of look, you know, the way that they looked at me, I said, the reason that you're looking at me that way, you're kind of shocked, but in Africa, this is kind of the norm. This stuff happens all the time through, like I said, Bishop Oyedipo, I think they raised 25 people from the dead um that that have all been medically documented Heidi Baker is big over there um you know I know that uh, Alpha Lucal they've done it I know several with TB Joshua he's passed but that ministry is still moving forward and my kids ask they're like so why is that happening over there and I said people are dying before their time you know when you go to Africa you'll see that there's a lot of adults that are missing a lot of grandparents that are missing when you do altar calls it's all kids. I'm, I'm like 80% of the people that were at the altar call, they were probably age 21 or less, you know, with, with uh, different sickness and different disease. They don't have the medicine that we have here in America. So guess what? Their only option is God. It can only be by Jesus that, that uh, okay, I'll, I'll send you the video later. It's, it's only by Jesus that they can be free. They don't have a plan B. You know, here in America, it's like, well, if prayer doesn't work, I can always go to the hospital. I can always take the medication. They don't have that option. So when they come up to an altar call, you can see it in their eyes that either you're going to pray for me and believe for my miracle, or I'm going to die. And it's life and death. So I told Eli, we were talking about it. I said, the Holy Spirit will show up in a congregation, will show up in a country, in a nation based on the need of the people. I said, the reason sometimes the perceived uh, 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 presence of God is stronger in those countries is because the need is stronger and God will always come in to meet the need. And the anointing that's on your life will be, will always be determined by the people that are around you. Why? Because they're the ones that are making a demand on it. The hungrier the people are, you will sense the greater the presence of God is on your life. Why? Because if he's going to get to them, he's got to go through you. So I can sense the hunger of the people based on the presence that's on my life, right? And so it's something that you experience, but they are a hungry people because it's life and death, you know, as far as faith is concerned. They're more spiritual than we are here in America because in America, if we have a little crazy going on, there's a pill that you'll see in every commercial, take this pill, take that pill, take that pill, and the problem will go away. The only problem with that, that's what I call disease management. And when we start tolerating evil in our lives and say it's not that bad, we are saying this thing can remain. And when we allow things to remain and it violates trust in God because we don't give God access to it, that is called a stronghold. So I don't care how manageable it is. If there's no end result where you're going to get completely free, then guess what? You need to turn that thing over to Jesus. So we know that testimonies are our inheritance, right? It's our job as parents and I talked about this, you know, I sat down with pastor um, and we had a meeting with, with the youth leaders. And I may have talked about this. 
when we sat down with the youth leaders, you know, and, and this conviction that I have, I'm sitting there looking at my kids, they're 13 and 16, and they have limited experience when it comes to the anointing. Now, they've been, you know, on the front of the altar when the demon eyes have been set free, when, you know, people have been, you know, healed, they've seen it for themselves, but it's easy for them to say, well, that's just dad. And I asked the youth leaders, I said, you know, as far as the kids are involved in, in the youth ministry, I said, when is, what's the highlight of their lives? You know, we have all these events, but what's the absolute highlight? And I think Mitch said, um, it's camp. And I said, why is camp such a highlight for them? Well, you know, we have worship. I'm like, well, we have worship here. And he goes, oh, he goes, we pray for one another and they have breakthrough. I said, they have personal encounters with Jesus. He goes, absolutely. And I'm like, well, why don't we do that every Sunday? You know, good question, right? And what I did, and I, I gave them the mandate. I said, I need you to start praying over my kids. I need you to start prophesying over my kids. I need the kids start praying over one another. And I need a kingdom culture to be established within the youth so the youth can have some experiences. You know, I heard some testimony of some kids that recently left. I said they left because there was no experience. It was just word being preached. And guess what? If the word is being preached and there's no experience, it's the seed that fell on the rocky soil. There's not going to be fruit in that thing, right? They're going to hang around for a bit because they see every now and then other people are getting it, but it's never impacted them. And if they don't have that experience, they're out, right? It's only, you can only hold on to it so long. When people come to church, they come to church with their problem. If the problem doesn't get resolved, they're going to try something else. That's why there were so many I won't say there's so many demonized in Africa. The difference between Africa and America is we have medication to suppress our emotions and every demonic attack comes through the soul, comes through our emotions. So the reason that, you know, we may see more manifestations in Africa, they don't have access to the medication. Take America off medication and you're going to see people come to church demonized. You, you, you'll see it. So anyways, let's move on. So we talked about Deuteronomy 6 and 17, where God says, I want you to keep the commandments. I want you to keep the statutes. And I want you to keep the testimonies. This is foundational. Now, you'll see in scriptures, wisdom and understanding are two sides of the same coin. What is wisdom? Wisdom is what God is doing, right? Wisdom is what God is doing. Understanding is why he's doing it, right? And God wants us to not only have wisdom, because God moves according to his word, right? That's where your commandments are. It says, obey the commandments. Why? Because God is moving according to his commandments. Now, you will see that obedience is rooted in wisdom, because obedience is you simply partnering with God as he's moving, right? So, and I know I'm going to get a little bit deeper here, but we have to know that when we keep the commandments of God and we keep the statutes, the commandments of God are obeying his, his word. The statutes are understanding why God wants us to obey the word. It's an understanding. God's not looking for robots. Why does God want you to have understanding? Because it's through understanding that you have life application. Get this. It's through understanding you have life application. Meaning, if I take this one word and I understand why God said it, then I can not only apply it to maybe finances, well, I can apply it to faith and healing. I can apply it to my depression. I can apply it to, you know, sickness and disease. It's when I have understanding of wisdom or the commandments of God, right? Then I can have life application in various different aspects of my life. So there are two sides of the same coin. So what is obedience and what do the statutes do? Well, obedience are what to think, statutes are how to think, right? Because you have understanding. But what's the fruit of commandments and statutes? It's the same fruit of wisdom and understanding. There's a testimony. What is a testimony? It's anything a witness saw God or they heard God say and do. It's being able to be involved in the movement of God. That's why in week one, I talked about the Ark of Testimony. What about the Ark of the Testimony? Well, we have the commandments of God that Moses had. We had the manna, you know, the, the gold pot of manna, which Israel was involved in. And we had Aaron's staff amongst all the leaders. His blossom budded and produced fruit, right? 
all three of those in the Ark of Testimony, the reason it was called an Ark of Testimony, it was what God did in the lives of people, right? And it's through that testimony that Jesus is saying, you still have access to it. You still have access to the prophetic power of God through the testimony of the people in the past. But here's the thing. If we don't start remembering what God did, then the activities of God in our lives start diminishing. That's why in communion, do this in remembrance of me. What is to remember? Remember is to go back to the place of origin and revisit it, right? And we have to constantly look at the testimonies of God. We have to stir up what God is doing in the lives of people. Now, I, I heard that there's six people in the last week or so that had financial breakthrough. Well, I didn't get a pay raise. I worked for myself. I didn't get a pay raise. But guess what I did? I took those six testimonies and I said, me too. God, if you're increasing their lives, you're increasing my lives. You know, I don't care who it is. I'm at the front row. Pastor's prophesying. I'm grabbing a hold of it. Why? Because it speaks prophetically over my life. And what does prophecy do? It'll change the current situation, right? So we have commandments, statutes, and testimonies. Now it says testimonies are my counselors, right? Testimonies are our counselors. What do they do? They test testimonies. They counsel us by revealing the nature of God and the principle of how he moves. Every day, there are situations that are required. They're requiring us to make decisions. As believers, our focus and desire to be directed towards what God is doing in these situations. What, what is God doing? What did I say wisdom was? Wisdom is what God's doing according to his word, right? According to his commandments. So wisdom is understanding, not just having the life application, but being able to discern what God is doing in a, in a certain situation, right? And if I'm missing the voice of God for my life, I can always go back to a testimony because I know God will revisit it. And I know that it will be a rhema activity. It'll be a now thing if I go back and I revisit the, the, uh, the testimony. But like I said, they counsel us. So Jesus said, you know, in, in his word, that his testimony is a spirit of prophecy, meaning that you could apply it to your life. But also testimonies are our counselors. Why? Because if you look at um, if you look at um, 2 Corinthians 13, 1, um, I don't even know if I put it in my notes. I didn't. It'll be, I'll talk about a little bit of tomorrow. Um, it says that every matter is established by the testimony of two and three witnesses. Think about this. Every matter is established by the testimony. Now, a lot of people, they turn to the word and they look at, okay, well, the testimony of Jesus is in the word. Okay, cool. But it says it's established by the testimony of two and three witnesses. What happens in the testimony? It's a prophetic word and prophecy changes things. So you're saying if I have a financial issue that I should go to somebody that has been a witness and has a testimony about financial breakthrough. Yes. Why? Testimonies are transferable. So if I'm struggling in a relational issue, then I go to somebody that has a godly relationship that has had success in their relationships in order to establish a matter that may not be lining up with the word and will of God for your life. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Why? Because the spirit of prophecy is released and God's grace is released through that testimony to make changes. So if, if I need anything, and I know Pastor Lynn Fleece is on here. I know that before she left work, she made a phone call to me. She goes, what did God tell you when you left work back in 1996? And I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, so I started telling her that I've been a tither for six months. And I knew that I was working at QSC at nights. And I knew if God was going to break me through into the, the financial realm that he wanted to break me into, that I had to get through this glass ceiling. And I knew making $16 an hour I wasn't going to get to the place in ministry, in life, uh, definitely wasn't going to impress my wife with, with $16 an hour back then, and I needed some breakthrough. So I was knocking on heaven's door, and I was taking some testimonies of people that have already just stood on the word of God and are successful. My pastor at the time was one of them. So I got on that testimony, and then all of a sudden, March uh, 17th, 1996, I remember it like it was yesterday, God comes to me. He says, you have three months to get your affairs in order. He said, because you're no longer going to be here. I said, what? You have three months to get your affairs in order. You're no longer going to be here. And I asked God, I said, what do I do? He goes, you've already started a business and you put it down. 
I'm like, yeah, I did. He goes, I called you that business. He goes, you have grace for that business. He goes, go back and start working that business. You have three months to make the transition. I freaked out. And about two weeks before June 17th, I was freaking out. Major dilemma. I'm like, I've always depended on a weekly paycheck. But I said, you know what? You only live life once. I can get a job in these places any old time. I said, you know what? I'm going to trust God. And I, I put my two weeks notice in. The enemy shortly after um, guaranteed me a pay raise and a promotion uh, if I stayed there. And it was a cold voice when I was walking out. I said, nope. I said, if you're going to make me an offer, then you obviously fear what God has for me. And that was in 1996. Since then, I've been terminally unemployable, right? And so, you know, that was the testimony that was released. Well, if somebody's looking to, you know, take that step, well, guess what? There's a word for you, you know, and it prophesies to people that God will meet you in that place. But oh, there's, <laughs> there you go. So Tracy Harrison just posted that she grabbed hold of that word. And she stood on that word to be able to make that transition into her own employment, right? So we have to create a culture of testimony and celebrate the testimony, but we have to understand you know, through this teaching, what's available. That's why I brought up the woman with the issue of blood. Everybody was touching Jesus when he walked through a crowd, but only one person knew what was available out of that crowd. Jesus said, there's many people that touch me, but virtue left me for one person. So everybody was touching Jesus and they didn't get their breakthrough. They didn't get their miracle. Why? Because there was no expectation of the will of God in that moment. She understood if she touched them, that virtue was going to be released. So she was the only one to discern that she had access to the power of God out in public in the middle of a crowd. She said, if I just touch him, I'll be made whole. And what did she do? Well, why am I saying this? Because when presence comes into the congregation or a testimony is released in the congregation, we need to know what we have access to. So our job, especially with pastor, you know, when there'll be times when I'm up taking up an offering or whatever, and all of a sudden, the atmosphere shifts, and he's like, Jesus is healing right now. So what do I do? We start praying for the sick. Why? Because it took one person to discern what God was doing in the midst of people, to align with his wisdom, right, in order to start moving with him in obedience. And, and the Lord spoke to me, I think it was last week in the offering. And, and I knew in the offering that there was a couple of conditions God was healing, but I looked, I looked up at the clock, and I'm like, we got to we got to get going with service. And later God rebuked me. And he essentially told me, you know, what I was doing at the pulpit. He said, you're quenching my spirit. He said, I don't care if you're doing an offering. He's like, I am healing and I need you to declare what I am doing. So the people that came to church can get the very thing that they came for. And he's like, and it wasn't a guilt thing. He's like, you denied them that experience. Well, I don't want to be in his way, and I don't want to deny him experiences. So I called pastor, and it's like, hey, if the Holy Spirit's moving, we're just going to be obedient to that and allow the Holy Spirit to move and heal who he wants to heal. Amen? So we got to kind of step back, and if I'm in the middle of a message and the Holy Spirit starts moving, you know, he'll move at the end of the message, but if I obey him in that moment, there's going to be greater impact than putting it on the back burner. So you know, sometimes we, we, we put messages together and like, oh, it's the world's greatest message. And then the Holy Spirit wants to move in the middle of it. It's like, well, I got two more points. It's like, you know, take your points, put them on the back burner, start flowing with the Spirit of God and trust in Him. There's going to be greater impact and greater power in obedience than you kind of do in your own thing. All right. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to wind this down. It says that in Proverbs 3, 19, it says, uh, the Lord by wisdom, He founded the earth. And by understanding, he established the heavens. Now, I'm writing off of this wisdom and understanding. It says, by wisdom, he founded the earth. And by understanding, he established the heavens. So everything begins with wisdom. And it's carried out and applied through understanding. So it's kind of a tricky verse. But knowing God and knowing what he's done in heaven, we know heaven is established. But we know here he laid the foundations of heaven. Once the foundation is laid, then it's established. Nothing can grow in life unless you have a foundation. Well, wisdom is your foundation. Once you have wisdom and you have understanding, understanding is an establishment, meaning it's an arising, you know, in the midst of whatever it is that you're involved in. So God already, he laid the foundations of heaven. 
he established heaven, but then it says, by wisdom, he, he laid the foundations of the earth. Well, hold on a sec. It says you didn't establish it. Now, heaven is our model, right? But it says, if you, if you allow me to paraphrase, he laid the foundations of heaven and he established it. Then he said, I laid the foundations of the earth. Okay, well, what about establishing it? Oh, that's your job. What did you just say? Oh, that's your job. I laid the foundations of heaven. I established it. And I laid the foundations of the earth. And he said, the only way I'm going to establish it is through working with my children. Isaiah 60 and 1 says, arise and shine for your light has come. How am I going to rise from anything if I don't have a solid foundation to push off from? Right? So what is the call of God in our lives? It says in Isaiah 2 and 2, it says, in the end days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established above every mountain. How is it going to be established? Through the righteous. So you mean God has a mandate to restore us, to redeem us, in order to use us to establish his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's exactly what I'm saying. Heaven is the blueprint for earth. And we have to be able to discern it through wisdom and understanding, have life application of what is going on around us, the activities of heaven through the testimonies, through wisdom, through understanding, in order to change the atmosphere around us, to eradicate darkness from this earth. That's our call in life, is to establish his kingdom on earth as is in heaven. And I thought it was interesting when I turned to that verse, I said, God, I said, you forgot establishing the earth. He goes, no, I didn't. He goes, that's your job. And that comes through the commission. He goes, you and I are going to establish my kingdom here on earth. And he says, one day with a new heaven and earth, then we can say that it's been established. And like I said, Isaiah 2 and 2 and Micah 4 and 1 prophesies that God's going to do it through his children, right? Um, Proverbs 24 and 3, through wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it's established. So I'm not going to get too much into that because I'm looking at the time. Um, let's see. Let's talk about wisdom. Uh, two more verses. It says, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way. This is in Proverbs 8, 22 and 23. Then it's in Proverbs 29 and 31. So I kind of got the middle part out of it. it. says, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way before his works of old. I have established from everlasting from the beginning before there was ever an earth. When he, and then it says, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as a master craftsman. And I was daily at his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing always before him. Watch this, rejoicing in his inhabited world. So God's not bummed out. And my delight was with the sons of men. So you were created from joy for joy. Think about it. You were created from joy for joy. The Holy Spirit says, I delighted in the sons of men. What's not in your notes is um, Exodus 31, 2 and 3, where it talks about the Holy Spirit uh coming on i can't remember his name uh the holy spirit uh coming on bezalel and it says when he came upon him in, in bezalel he came upon him in the form of a craftsman and what happened it says his ability changed he was able to do all the things building the tabernacle of god you know the goblets candlesticks he was able to do things he could not do before. So it says the presence of God literally changed his ability. If God ever calls you out from your comfort zone and tells you to do something that you're not comfortable doing, and he pulls you out beyond your level of convenience, go back to Exodus 31, verse 2 and 3, and proclaim that over your life because it says that the Holy Spirit can come upon you in wisdom and give you the giftings of a craftsman to be able to make things or change your ability to do things you could not do before, to qualify the unqualified, right? And that's the word I had to stand on when I created a restoration business. And it says in uh, Zechariah 1, 18 and 20, it says, then I looked up and there before me were four horns. Four horns talk about global powers of evil, right? When we go north, south, east, and west, it's talking globally. So then I looked up and there before me were four horns. There were global powers. And it says, and I asked the angel who was speaking to me, what are these? He answered me, these are the horns that scatter Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. And I asked, what are these coming to do? He answered, these are the horns that scatter Judah so that no one can raise their hand, but the craftsmen have come to terrify them and throw down these horns. To throw down these horns in the nations who lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter its people. 
So what happens in the end times is it says global powers are going to arise, but God is going to raise up the craftsmen. What's he going to do? He's going to speak a prophetic word, even through, even if it's through a testimony, and he's going to change your ability. And when he changes your ability, he's going to allow you to contend with the forces of evil in this world, right? So you can go all the way back to Isaiah 54 and 17. So you'll have the ability based on your inheritance to condemn the voices of darkness that attempt to accuse you, not just condemn them, but break through them, right? And that's your heritage. And these are the things that our children need to know. And like I said, not to be redundant, but if we're not having an experience, our children aren't having an experience. Ministry starts off at the home. The kingdom of God starts off in your home. And if it's not working at home, it's not going to work in the church, right? It's got to start working in our home. We have to start talking. And I'm not talking hyper-religious with our kids. But I am saying exposing our children to signs, wonders, and workings of miracles. I'm talking to our children about the Holy Spirit breaking through the impossibilities of life. And the reason I'm talking about this is because if I expose my children to the testimonies of God, and it becomes real to them, well, what's going to happen when they're facing their own impossibilities? They're going to say, man, I work with my mom and my dad, and we broke through these things. I watched mom and dad break through the impossibilities of life. I not only witnessed them, I was a part of them. So what's going to happen? Instead of your children being rebellious against you, they're now going to have hope for what you've experienced because they've experienced it as well. And so what are they going to do? When darkness comes out their door, they're going to fight. And they're going to know that the power of the Holy Spirit working in their lives through the testimony, through their experience, will break through it themselves. And that's the only way when I was talking to the youth, I said, guys, the only way that we can get breakthrough in our youth is we got to get some experiences in their lives. We got to give them not just the experience, but we got to give them something to fight for. And it's not just preaching all the time. It's being able to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, because once that thing is real in their lives, watch this, once it is real, it says you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What is truth again? It's God's more ultimate reality, and reality is a world as it actually exists. Once they have an unobstructed view of the kingdom of God in an open heaven, what does it say? It says that they're going to be free, but the only way that they're going to be able to see it, and they're going to be able to walk in it, is if we as parents make them aware of it. And once we make them aware of it, then the Holy Spirit is going to invite them into it. And it's the only way it's going to work. You can't just preach at your kids. You got to pray for your kids. You got to tell them about the goodness of God, you know, that's happening in your life or the lives of people. Show them the YouTube videos, whatever it is you got to do. Don't freak them out. I do. I only sent that out to a few people. And the reason I only sent that out to a few people I know people have these lists. You know, people come to me after church, and I've had six or seven people come up to me. Hey, Pastor Greg, hey, what's up with that falling down thing at the altar? I'm like, oh, you've never been at the altar. And so what you're doing is you're asking me about an experience that you have not had. Well, 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 yeah, okay, I get it. Well, I don't show certain videos. I don't post them on YouTube. You know, I don't post them to the, the church site because I understand that people have lists. And I know it'll freak them out. So I got to kind of ease them into certain things, right? That's why I... My preaching has changed over the years where I could talk about stuff that I couldn't talk about a few years ago because people have seen not just the, the declaration, they've seen the demonstration. Like, okay, and God is going to continue to expand your boundaries and cut outside the lines. But again, it's not good enough for it just to end with you, right? It's got to be passed on to our children and it's got to be passed on to the youth, you know, and it's it's not only a command, but it's the very thing that will equip them. The world's not getting any better. It's the very thing that will equip them with the impossibilities of life. I don't have all your answers, but I'm going to give you access to the same God I have access to. I don't want you to worship the God I worship. I want you to have your own experience and you worship your own God. That's, that's my goal as a parent. So what do I do as a parent? I've told Eli, because he's 16, I said, you may be preaching here soon. What does that look like? So I'm talking about preparation. Preparation takes on the burden tomorrow today. 
And what do I do? He reads 10 to 15 minutes every morning. Then I ask him, because it's about a 10, 12 minute trip to school, because I give him a ride every morning. What did you read this morning? And what did you get from it? And that's our topic of conversation. But what I do is I put life application into it. You know, how are you going to utilize it? Well, it says blah, blah, blah. Have you ever thought of this, this, and this? How are you going to apply it on a relational level, you know, in the lives of people? He has to be able to see the application. He has to have the understanding so he can apply one principle in several aspects of his life. And if he doesn't do it, then he's just reading a history book, right? And this is something that he can apply in his life. But I have to intentionally bring this stuff up, but I got to know my kids and not push him too hard, you know, in, in one area. But I have to show him it's attainable for his life. In order to do that, I have to expose him to it, right? So that's all I got for you guys. Um, it's 8.50. Do you guys have any comments before we go through announcements? Yes, I have a comment. <clears throat> Pastor, you mentioned T.D. Joshua, Bishop Oyedipu, and Heidi Baker. What was the other one? Oh, Alf Lucal. How do you spell that? A-L-P-H-L-U-K-A-U. He has a prophetic on his life that's scary. One of the, one of the testimonies was um, a, uh, they thought their child was dead. This lady was told her child was dead. He said, no. He said, a woman by the name of Joyce has your son in this city. Whoa. And I'm sitting there freaking out. He said, let's call her. And she goes, I don't have her number. He goes, I do. He told her to get on her cell phone. He goes, dial this number. It's an international number. I would be impressed with, the 10 digit number. It was an international number with the 011 and all these other numbers. And this lady picks up and she goes, is this Joyce? She so goes, yes, this is Joyce. Who is this? I'm the mother of so-and-so. And I know you have my son and I want my son back. And she goes, she goes, I'm sitting here with Pastor Alf Lucal. If you grab my son and you run and you try and hide again, she said, we will find you. And the woman released the child because the prophetic freaked her out. And this guy is like on a level that, but, but here's the thing. I grab hold of the testimony. What am I doing? I'm provoking God because God, if you can do this in the life of one person, now I understand inheritance is released at a date of maturity. God won't release something in your life. That's going to break. I get all that. What I'm saying, what I do is I access the power of God at a level that I'm not walking in. Why? Because I start tugging on God. So God can take me to that place, right? And what happens with the people around me? They're going with me too, right? So anyways, he's a good guy to watch. And um, I, I think Al Flukau is, I, I think is more, you would get more out of him. Um, uh, Bishop Oyedipu does a lot of teaching. Uh, it really kind of depends on where you're at. Uh, TB Joshua, God rest his soul, he's passed, but he's a big deliverance guy. Um, and uh, yeah. A lot of wisdom from Miles Monroe. So, um, but yeah, I would, I, you know, again, it's just every time I subscribe, their videos come up. I just, I just watch it and I send it out to people and they're like, okay, this is crazy. But, you know, I'm, I'm very careful who I send it to because again, um, yeah, when he raised the guy from the dead, the uh, guy was in a coffin on the way to the cemetery in the news media took out the clip where Pastor Alf Lucal said he's breathing. So as soon as the body hit the lot, hit the ministry, they saw that his chest was rising and falling, and there was a little bit of movement, and Pastor Alfred Cow said, he's breathing, and it was from that that he told him to rise up, and he got him out of the coffin and, you know, brought him into church, but again, for most people, it's like, we got to look at the fault. Why? Because it violated the limitations that they placed on God. God doesn't raise the dead. It's like, well, there's actually quite a few testimonies, even medical testimonies where it's happened, so, and it's not just a sovereign move of God. A lot of times it's an intentional where God is using a man or woman of God to raise these people up. So anyways, but like I said, these are the limitations that I watch. So when I look at the dead being raised, getting out of a coffin, then I got someone saying, hey, I have a headache. I'm like, God can raise the dead. He could definitely take care of your headache. So we all have a starting point, but I also need a place to know where I'm going. So anybody else? I just wanted to say that this is really profound word for the children's ministry also. And we've just been talking about, we need to make sure that even little, little kids are having the opportunity to have an experience and pray, pray with each other, be prayed over. So we're really trying to integrate that into our Sunday school too. Yeah. And I think, and that's a very good point. I see your hand. 
I think also is, is what I talked to Mitch about is, is doing a breakthrough class for the youth. It's for the youth to be able to be um, um, moving in, in, in words of knowledge. And because I know Eli had gone to the youth a couple of times, he had words of knowledge, but nobody knew what to do with it, right? They didn't know, well, if God's revealing, he's ready to, to heal it. So, so it's something that, yes, we have to create that culture. Um, Roy, you had your hand up. Yeah, no, I was remembering uh, not only in service, but you mentioned in the beginning on how some uh, people may be struggling this year because of um, turmoil, et cetera. And that, that began to kind of stir me up to really seek God more. So that doesn't happen to me, <laughs> uh, for example. And as I begin to pursue God, um, God's been actually moving in um, my finances and regarding investments in a very profound profound way and while everyone else is struggling in this market i'm having tremendous success and and a part of that i was kind of reviewing some of the things on tithing um through ron carpenter and some other things and mm -hmm. god began to speak to me on how uh when he was talking for example when we tithe that you give your tenth to god because it's holy and I begin to ask myself, well, why is it holy? Why do we have to um, do only a tenth? Why is that holy? And one thing he didn't say that God began to speak to me about is because God provided a law to Adam and said that your ground is cursed. And so God began to speak to me because when we receive income, that that income technically is cursed. So in order for us to have the blessing, we have to get that curse and sanctify it so it can be blessing. The only way you sanctify it is you give it to God so it can be blessed. So we give that tenth so the whole 100% can be blessed. Like, and then well, God's going to show me some other things. And through that and some other revelation he was giving me, it just really kind of blew my mind. Because it provided a different perception than always here. Okay, not, not, that's not a chance. No God's yet, holy, so you give your part. This. But it's like, no, no, no. To so have, we are provided a curse from Adam because of the law that God gave. You'd be cursed by the sweat of your brow and by the thorns and thistles. But you give that part because in order to have that blessing, it has to be sanctified by me. I have to be involved. And as far as, as, far as finances, that's why that that tenth is holy, and so God, God began to kind of move in my finances in a very tremendous way. So I, I know that through God I'm gonna have a tremendous year. Um, but also one last thing is God also spoke to me. I'll say this one last thing is pretty important um, that God began to show me is that when you begin to give that ten percent um, to me to not only be blessed, but that act is an act of obedience. Because you are saying, God, you know what? I'm going to believe you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to do that. Now, when you make that act of obedience, that opens up Deuteronomy 28. When it's like over like 15 scriptures on how God will guarantee a blessing on everything you do. That's 28A. And he will conquer your enemies and he will scatter them seven times. Your children will be blessed. Your offspring will be blessed. Your, your fruit baskets will be blessed. So we begin to kind of pour out a different angle on tithing. I just want to just encourage anyone to kind of um, see God on that, and, and you will have a blessing when everyone else struggles. And 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 I and I agree with that. And that lines up with you know with talking about the open hand of God. But you guys remember the prophetic word I gave November seventh, twenty twenty, November being you know number eleven, which is disorder and chaos. But He gave it to me on the seventh, which means a, a completion so there was two contrasting realities that were going on and that's what roy is saying that that there's a contrasting reality going on but when he's talking about a tenth tenth means completion it means in its fullness so it's that tenth that covers the whole ground that allows it to draw the nutrients which are grace from your ground which is which is powerful when you grab a hold of it um anybody else before we wrap up yeah, I wanted to um, give a small testimony about my mom. Uh, I grew up, everything that you're talking about, of course, I grew up with that in Woods' church. And so 
I grew up experiencing miracle signs and wonders in my church. Um, my mom, and I was a teenager, and um, looking back on it, you know, Einstein or revelation from the Holy Spirit, she used to pray for us all the time. I mean, we were smothered in olive oil at least once a day <laughs> all the time. And so we were never ill. We didn't go to the doctor. We went to the doctor at the school required it, but we were never sick. And I, I always took that for granted. I mean, I never even thought about it. It just, you know, it's just something that it was just supposed to be that way. And one of the other things <clears throat> going to Pastor Woods' church is um, during the 70s, every type of cult activity that you could possibly think of was happening in Seattle. But we never fell prey to any of the cults. Jim Jones, the Moonies, and everybody else that you can think of was walking around here in Seattle. And it just, there was no curiosity. We had never had any desire to to understand, you know, what they were talking about. And I know that was the grace of God and my mother's um, ability to stay in the word of God and, and pray for us. She was a very quiet woman. She didn't preach at us, but she prayed for us all the time. And, um, and, I'm, and I'm just so grateful for that. That's awesome. And there's no small testimony. <laughs> They're all big. So, I'm going to go ahead and, and thank you guys for sharing. Um, we're going to go ahead and wrap this call. Uh, we do, let's see, as far as tomorrow, I don't think that there's anything pre-service going on tomorrow. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so service should be at 1030 tomorrow. Uh, empowered, we are, we're actually, uh, I got to get with Jenny, and uh, but we are, February 6th, Empowered is going to start. Uh, I've had some phone calls from people that are dealing with some pretty big things in their lives. And I just told them, I said, number one, get in church. I said, number two, get empowered. And, uh, and what we're going to do, I know Jenny's been studying a lot of the autoimmune disorders. Uh, I have a book on it. Um, we are going to, I got to get with her. I got to get with Kristen. Um, we're going to add to uh, empowered, not to extend it, but we're probably going to create a, a separate class. I know, uh, Melissa, you asked something about it too. Um, and just to answer your question, Melissa, um, every situation is different. So there are some causes for some of the reasons she doesn't have an issue. She has a friend. Um, and, and so there are different things that are going on. So Jenny gave me a list of them because everybody's kind of researching their own little thing. And then we're just coming back together and kind of putting it together so we can put a program in the church, but we are going to go back into spiritual roots of disease because again, I have some attacks on the health of people in my family autoimmune disorders. We, we have to go there because I believe God's going to give us the grace to break through it. And we're not just satisfied with healing, with just deliverance, but we, we got to start going after the issues where it says etiology unknown. The science has a no known cause. And those are the issues of the soul that I want to go after. God's given me some words, um, but I definitely want to start going after them. But I also want to introduce the church to show them this is what we're also doing and, and what we're also studying. And, you know, if somebody feels like, hey, I want to be a part of this thing and kind of, you know, push this thing a little bit further. Um, you know, I want to be the church where, where wherever it is you have, it's kind of like when you're a contractor, they call you and they're like, uh, hey, can you do this, this, and this? I'm like, we do it. We do everything. And I want to be that church was like, hey, we do everything. We take on every problem, every situation, but I want to be equipped for it. And, and God, once we start equipping it, getting ourselves equipped in that area, he's going to start bringing the people. So after Empowered, like I said, you're going to see a little more crazy coming into the church because these people are hurt, but I still want to go after a lot of the autoimmune disorders that people, what I call a manageable disease, because there's no known cure. So anything that there's no known cure for, I want to start going after and, and seeing people get set free. I, I believe with everything in me that, that God wants to restore these people and get them off the medication. But again, you know, we have to kind of lay a foundation, the theological side, but also, you know, the condition of the soul is huge. So that's all I have. So I'm going to go ahead and did I miss any announcements? Anything else we got going on? Okay. Cool. Yeah, Greg, we have a, um, the Bible journaling class that is also going to start 
on Saturday, February 12th, and that's 11 to 1 for about a month. It goes till March 9th. And so if people still want to sign up for that, it's $35. If they can't afford the $35, there is a scholarship. They just need to contact Lisa Wright about getting signed up. And that covers that price covers the supplies um, for the class. And, and then since you're talking about that, Deanna's online. Deanna, I want to talk oh. to you about your for women only class. Yeah, that's right. Deanna, tell us a little bit about that since we're switching to the book for women only um, this